Hello everyone, my name is John Sierra and I am a Tolkien scholar. That means that I'm the guy that you can come to with questions about The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, The Silmarillion, any of Tolkien's other works, or just the man himself. And if you want to ask a question, you can go ahead and leave a comment and of course I'll try to get to that. But if you want to be featured in a video, the best way to do that is to ask your question on Quora. If you've never heard of Quora, it's just a question and answer website. And every week I will take the uh, the very best questions or the most interesting questions from the previous week that I have uh, answered on Quora and feature them in a video. So there's a link to my Quora account in the description as well as a link to my special space, The Grey Havens, where all of my answers are posted and we have a lot of like-minded individuals on there. I am happy to say, before we get into the question and answer and the reading and everything, that the channel is still doing well. We are at over a 540 subscribers as of me recording this right now, and I have a new announcement to make. So as you guys might know because you saw last week's video about me reacting to and doing an analysis of the Hobbit Ashcan short film from 1966. That is the first part in a series that I'm going to be doing of reviewing and analyzing different adaptations of Tolkien's works. Some of them are going to be very well known, some of them are going to be not so well known like that one was. Pretty much trying to go in order of release. Um, but yeah, but we have an editor now, we have a team and everything, so uh, things are going to be a little bit different. You might notice that this video is a little bit more upgraded and everything. We have a higher resolution, we have images that are going to appear on the screen, and we have title cards and all sorts of other cool things. And as a YouTube partner, we are going to be, or may have by the time you see this, we are going to be enabling memberships. Now, a membership is like a paid subscription, where you will get certain perks and you will get certain uh, badges and such. We gotta make the badges and everything. Uh, but what am I offering for my members? That's the big thing that I've had to contemplate. We have not enabled it yet, but hopefully by the time you see this video, it will be enabled. So because we now have an editor, um, what we're going to be doing is kind of changing the way that I th do things. Normally the videos come out Wednesday and they're recorded just the day before. I record the videos on Tuesday and then upload them on Wednesday. Now the way that it's going to be is I will record them on Tuesday, give them to my editor and that they will upload them and they will go live the next Wednesday. That's why we had that Hobbit video in there in place to sort of give a week's lead time going forward. That being said, um, the videos are not going to take like a full week for editing, so members are going to get early access to the videos. So basically, as soon as the videos go live, members are going to be able to see them, whereas everybody else will have to wait for the scheduled Wednesday release. Um, there is also going to be a few other perks that I'm going to be uh, coming up with and going over, and it's all going to be on the membership page. But for now, let's get into the actual video, and we're going to start with a reading. And uh, this week I've decided I wanted to read a little bit of the more whimsical poetry that Tolkien has from The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, which I have here in uh, my very, very ancient and beleaguered copy of the Tolkien Reader. I think this, honestly, this book might be older than I am. I got this at a bookstore in upstate New York. It's the same place where I got my original a copy of the Silmarillion. Yeah, this is from 1976. It's four years older than I am. So I'm going to read uh, Bombadil Goes Boating here. Not the entirety of it, but a good amount of it. Bombadil Goes Boating is a poem about Tom Bombadil. It does not appear in The Lord of the Rings. Um, you can only find it in The Adventures of Tom Bombadil or, you know, in The Tolkien Reader, which contains many such of the smaller publications, such as Farmer Giles of Ham and Leaf by Niggle and On Fairy Stories and, and this and that. And in Universe, I believe this was written by Samwise, so the things in this are not really um, true. It's not canon, as they say, to anything about Tom Bombadil, but this is a poem that was supposedly written by Samwise Gamgee about Tom Bombadil. I'm going to read you the first, uh, the first little bit of it. The old year was turning brown, the west wind was calling. Tom caught a beechen leaf in the forest falling. I've caught a happy day blown me by the breezes. Why wait till morrow year? I'll take it when me pleases. This day I'll mend my boat and journey as it chances, west down the withy stream following my fancies. Little bird sat on twig, Willow Tom, I need you. I've a guess, I've a guess where your fancies lead you. 
Shall I go, shall I go, bring him word to meet you? No names you tell tale, or I'll skin and eat you. Babbling in every ear, things that don't concern you. If you tell Willow Man where I've gone, I'll burn you, roast you on a willow spit. That'll end your prying. Willow Wren cocked her tail, piped as she went flying. Catch me first, catch me first, no names are needed. I'll perch on his hither ear, the message will be heeded. Down by myth, I'll say, just as the sun is sinking. Hurry up, hurry up, that's the time for drinking. Tom laughed to himself, maybe then I'll go there. I might go by other ways, but today I'll row there. He shaved oars, patched his boat from hidden creaky halter, through reed and sallow break under leaning alder. Then down the river went singing, silly sallow, flow withy willow stream over deep and shallow. Whee, I'm Tom Bombadil, whither ye be going, bobbing in a cockle boat down by the river rowing. Maybe to Brandywine along the withy windle. Maybe friends of mine, fire me for I will kindle. Down by the haze end, little folk I know there. Kind at the day's end, now and then I go there. Take word to my kin, bring back their tidings. Tell me of diving pools and the fish's hidings. Nay then, said Bombadil, I am only rowing, just to smell the water like, not on errands going. Tee cocky Tom, mind your tub don't founder. Look out for willow snags, I'll laugh to see you flounder. Talk less, Fisher Blue, keep your kindly wishes. Fly off and preen yourself with the bones of fishes. Gay lord on your bow at home a dirty varlet, living in a sloven house though your breast be scarlet. I've heard of fisher birds, beak in an air a-dangling, to show how the wind is set, that's an end of angling. The king's fisher shut his beak, winked his eye as singing. Tom passed under a bow, flash, and then went winging. Dropped down, jewel blew a feather, and Tom caught it, gleaming in a sunray, a pretty gift, he thought it. He stuck it in his tall hat, the old feather casting. Blue now for Tom, he said, a merry hue and lasting. Ring swirled round his boat, he saw the bubbles quiver. Tom slapped his oar, smack at a shadow in the river. Hoosh, Tom Bombadil, tis long since I last met you. Turn water boatman, eh? What if I upset you? What? Why, whisker lad, I'd ride you down the river. My fingers on your back would set your hide a shiver. Fish, Tom Bombadil, I'll go and tell my mother. Call all our kin to come, father, sister, brother. Tom's got mad as a coot with wooden legs he's paddling down withy windle stream, an old tub a-straddling. I'll give your otter fell to Balrowites, they'll taw you, and smother you in gold rings, your mother, if she saw you. She'd never know her son, unless twas by a whisker. Nay, don't tease old Tom, until you be fat brisket. Whoosh, said otter lad, river water spraying, over Tom's hat and all, set the boat a-swaying. Dive down under it, and in the bank lay peering, till Tom's merry song faded out of hearing. Old Swan of Elver Isle sailed past him proudly, gave Tom a black look, snorted at him loudly. Tom laughed, you old cob, do you miss your feather? Give me a new one then, the old one's worn by weather. Could you speak a fair word, I would love you dearer, long neck and dumb throat, but still a haughty sneerer. If one day the king returns, in upping he may take you, brand your yellow bill and less lordly make you. Old Swan huffed his wings, hissed and paddled faster. In his wake, bobbing on, Tom went rowing after. Tom came to Withywear, down the river rushing. Foamed onto Windle Reach, a bubbling and a splashing. Bore Tom over stone, spinning like a windfall, bobbing like a bottle cork to the height that Grindwall. Hoy, there's Woodman Tom with his billy beard on, laughed all the little folk of Hayes End and Baradon. Where, Tom, we'll shoot you dead with our bows and arrows. We don't let forest folk nor bogies from the barrows cross over Brandywine by cockle boat nor ferry. Fie, little fat bellies, don't ye make so merry. Well, there, there's more, obviously. It's quite a long poem. It's about maybe a third of it or so. I don't want to read, obviously, the whole thing out, but that's a little bit of uh, Bombadil Goes Boating, this sort of a very whimsical tale of Tom Bombadil deciding to go on his boat down the river and just being just hassled by everybody, every which way. There are animals that are sort of trying to annoy him. I don't know why, but, you know. Sort of a very, very, very interesting thing. So anyway, let's get into your questions. We have um, 17 questions today. It was submitted by 
Oh, oh dear. Can I say this name? This is so... Olufimileo Elegba. That's a difficult one, but I hope I, I hope I did it at least 60% good. Who is Aula? Okay, so Aula is one of the Valar, and he's one of the most important ones for better and for worse. Aula is the Vala most associated with crafts and creation. He has no siblings and is married to Yavanna. Aula is mostly known for creating the dwarves, uh, whom he created out of impatience with the empty world and wanting to fill it with all different sorts of life. As this is very similar to the motivations that Melkor had in the Void, uh, where Melkor wanted to fill the Void with all different forms of life, Aula's actions were very closely scrutinized by Iluvatar. But as Aula was repentant and he had actually good motivations the dwarves were allowed to live they were given true life by luvatar aule was known to teach crafts to the maiar and and the elves as well and the two of his most well-known pupils were Myron and kurum kurumo and if you don't know how that turned out well let me just tell you that Myron is better known as sauron and kurumo is better known as saruman and another one of his students uh, was actually Feanor. So, um, yeah, he doesn't have a great track record there for students. However, Aula is not evil. He just has uh, bad luck with students, I guess. He did manage to bring one of the rogue Maya uh, back into the fold because Ose, who was a, a Maya that served Olmo, had joined Melkor. And it was Aula's idea to send Uinen after him. And Uinen, in the early versions of Tolkien's work, she was sort of like a queen of mermaids. She later became a, a water Maya that served under um, Olmo. And she became Ose's wife. So uh, basically love brought Ose back into the fold there. So that worked out wonderfully. Okay, next question. Is the witch king a king of witches or a witch who is also a king? Uh, it would be the latter, which was explained very well in a book called The Lord of the Rings, A Reader's Companion. In this book, um, the authors, uh, Wayne G. Hammond and Christina Skull, justify Tolkien's use of the term witch king. In modern English, the term witch tends to be heavily gendered. Uh, however, uh, Tolkien was deriving it from the Middle English witch, which is synonymous with sorcerer, and it's not gendered in the least. So the witch king is a king, and he is a sorcerer, a practitioner of witchcraft, or, or a necromancer, as they're also called in Tolkien's work. He's not the king of witches, though. Okay, next Huam, I hope I'm saying that right. Could Sheila devour light such as her mother and Goliath? And if she could, why was she afraid of the light of the Arundel if that has originated from a Silmaril, which was what her mother desired to consume the most? So these are the sorts of questions that they sort of really answer themselves. Sheila doesn't have a desire to consume light. Uh, Sheila being afraid of and even recoiling from the file of Galadriel shows that she has no affinity for light. She's not like her mother in that way. She is like her mother in the way that she's extremely food motivated, uh, but she didn't consume light, she consumed people. She was never described as eating light, nor was she described as spewing light back up as unlight like her mother on Goliath did. The file is a pseudo silmaril uh something that samwise had pointed out and it was made of the same light as the silmarils the, the light of yarn the light of the two trees though it was encased in glass rather than the mysterious selima and it was not hallowed by varda so it was a lot less potent than a silmaril was in terms of uh burning evil or turning evil away um but it was enough to drive back um, the extremely light-sensitive Shelob. Her eyes were very sensitive to light. So even this, which was not hollowed, it was in glass, so it probably wasn't magnified as much. It probably wasn't as beautiful as one of the Silmarils, but it was still enough to turn her away, to uh, cause her to feel, feel pain, uh, if not from 
the burning of a hollowed Silmaril, but just from the light because she was so sensitive to light. So, yeah, she's she probably takes more after her father, which would have been one of the many sort of like unknown spirits from deep within the earth that came up and took sort of a monstrous spider form and they made it with Ungoliant and that created Shelob and, and many other uh, spiders as well. Shelob was described as the last daughter of Ungolian, probably the last one left alive, if not literally the last one. Okay, but interesting question. All right, next one. How long did Legolas stay in Middle-earth after the events of the Lord of the Rings? Um, so, to answer this, you have to sort of determine where does the Lord of the Rings actually end? Um, let's say it's the dawn of the Fourth Age. Uh, when Elrond sails west, by Gondorian reckoning at least. So that would mean that Legolas stayed in Middle-earth, not on Middle-earth, because it's not a planet, it's a continent, the planet's called Arda. He, he was in Middle-earth for 120 years after the Lord of the Rings. So according to the appendices in the Lord of the Rings, um, Legolas sailed to the west along with Gimli from the Bay of Belphilus, using a ship of his own construction. This happened in the first age year 120. So it would be 120 years after the departure of Elrond uh, from using the Gondor calendar at least. Okay, next question. Did Arwen wear any elven rings in The Lord of the Rings? If so, which one did she wear? Uh, so no, Arwen did not wear uh, a ring of power. There were only three rings that were retained by the elves uh, after Sauron stormed Oregion and he stole the rest. One was held by Gil-galad, another by Galadriel, and a third by Círdan. In the late Third Age, when the Lord of the Rings took place, the situation had changed somewhat. Uh, Galadriel still had her ring, but Gil-galad had passed away, and before he passed away, he gave his ring to Elrond. Um, that was shortly before they left to go into the, the Last Alliance War. Círdan secretly gave his ring to Gandalf. All three of the rings passed to the West with their holders, as Gandalf, Galadriel, and Elrond all passed to the West uh, together on the same ship that Bilbo and Frodo and Gildor were on. Arwen, though she remained in Middle-earth, um, and if she had any sort of ring, it wasn't a ring of power. It would have been a, a wedding ring because she, she stayed to uh, marry Aragorn. Okay, next question. Could Gandalf have saved the group from Durin's Bane if he had been able to cast a spell on it during their first encounter in Moria? Um, well, here's the thing. He actually tried that, and the result was Gandalf going tumbling down the Great Stair. Uh, before they met on the bridge, Gandalf tried to get cute with the magic and seal whatever it was that was chasing them because they hadn't seen it yet. They didn't know it was a Balrog tried to seal it behind a door. So that kind of spell to, to shut a door with magical force could only be countered by something of equal power or greater power. The counter spell created an explosion that sent Gandalf careening backwards and tumbling down a very long flight of stairs. So let's have Gandalf explain exactly how bad that was. I'm going to read you a small passage from the Fellowship of the Ring. Well, well, that's over, said the wizard, struggling to his feet. I have done all that I could, but I have met my match and have nearly been destroyed. But don't stand there, go on. You will have to do without light for a while, I am rather shaken. Go on, go on, where are you, Gimli? Come ahead with me. Keep close behind, all of you." So clashing magic with the Balrog nearly destroyed Gandalf. It seems that the, the same may have been true for the Balrog as well, uh, because it was almost buried by the explosion. When the two met again shortly after this on the Bridge of Khazad-dûm, uh, they did not try the same methods. I think at that point they both knew that magic was not going to work because they were too evenly matched. Okay, next question. This is really good. This is an excellent question. It came in anonymously, but it's a it's an interesting question, and it's a topic that I. Um, I enjoy speaking about because it's one of the great mysteries of, of Tolkien's world. How long does it take for an elf to fade, approximately? Uh, 
So like I said, this is a really good question, by which I mean that there isn't a concrete, definite answer, but we can come to some conclusions based on what we do know. First of all, it's important to define what it means to fade. Elves were meant to be in Middle-earth. That's where they awoke, uh, that's their ancestral home. However, due to the marring of Middle-earth by Melkor, the land is tainted with evil and the Valar made the difficult choice, some would say the incorrect choice, but the difficult choice nonetheless, to migrate as many elves as were willing to the Undying Lands. Now, while some elves were unwilling or others did not complete the journey, they had their ways to compel elves to sail to the west, such as the Unquiet of Ulmo, also known as the Sea Longing, which would fill an elves soul with the urge to sail to the uttermost west. If the elves stay in Middle-earth for too long, they can eventually fade. They lose their bodies and they become houseless spirits. Now the end of this, uh, the, the result of fading is that their soul, which is called a Fea, overcomes their body, which is called a Hroa, and they basically, their body basically sort of burns off and they become this houseless spirit, a houseless elf. It is at this point that they are more directly able to be compelled to come to the West, to Mandos. However, Tolkien did allow for the situation where some elves with extremely strong wills can even resist this summons and still choose to stay in Middle-earth as houseless spirits if they wish. So what does fading look like in practice? That's the end of it. But what is the beginning of it? When does it start? How long does it take? These are the questions implied here. Tolkien never directly answered any of these questions, but he gave us a few hints. One such big hint is Círdan, the shipwright. He's a very important character in the Silmarillion who also appears at the very end of The Lord of the Rings. Now, Círdan in The Lord of the Rings is described as being very old. He has long silver hair and a long silver beard. Now, originally, Tolkien said that elves could not grow beards, but that they would have three phases of life. The first is their childhood, the second being their very, very long adult life, and then the third being an eventual old age. They were still immortal, but they would appear old, and then at that point they could grow beards. Tolkien changed his mind about elderly elves. He decided not to do the whole third phase of life thing, but Círdan the elderly bearded elf was already written into the Lord of the Rings. So why? What is going on there? So the only other elf ever mentioned as having a beard, well, there were two of them. Uh, well, no, there was just one. Uh, there was Martin. He was the uh, only one that had a beard. And there was Gwyndor, who is the only other elf that was described as appearing elderly. So let's tackle them one at a time. Martin's beard was only mentioned once in the Shibboleth of Feanor. Um, and no mention of him having a beard ever made its way into the Silmarillion or any of its satellite stories. Only this obscure portion of uh, the, the Vinyar Tangwar, which was republished in the Peoples of Middle-earth. This puts Matan having a beard in sort of questionable canon. It's derived from an early version of the Legendarium that was later revised. But regardless of whether or not the Silmarillion, which is canon, that version of Martin has a beard or not, it's not mentioned, um, him having one, if he did, was never really explained. So that's, I like to think that like he didn't have a beard. It was just in the early versions of the tales, Tolkien sort of played with the idea that Martin had a beard, and then he decided he didn't. Uh, but he never wrote about it. He never described him as not having a beard, because why, why would he? Well, elves just don't have beards. You would describe why he had one, but you wouldn't describe why he didn't have one, if you catch uh, my uh, meaning there. Gwyndor, however, let's talk about Gwyndor. Gwyndor gives us a better window into the ideas of aging and fading. Círdan's beard remains unexplained in the general text. No other elves were said to have them, even in Middle-earth, and there were certainly Avari, and other Sindar elves who were as old as Gwyndor, or, or maybe even older. Um, so, he, you know, but Gwyndor was not very, very old. Even though he appeared so, 
He was a normal elf who was captured by Melkor and tormented. Gwyndor eventually escaped, but the ordeal had made him become old, and he had many scars, to the point that upon his returning to his family and his old, his old girlfriend Fenduilus, they didn't even recognize him. They didn't even realize it was him at first. So this to me shows that Melkor's power can make the elves appear old. Círdan got a long, slow dose of Melkor's power. It, it, like being exposed to low-level radiation for tens of thousands of years. And he aged. Gwyndor got it more directly. It's like being close to a nuclear disaster. He aged suddenly and rapidly. So I've come to believe in the past that this aging is the first visual sign of fading. And then the book, The Nature of Middle-earth came out where Tolkien just straight up confirmed that. So there you go. The bodies of the Eldar um, were not meant to age past adulthood, but through the evil taint of Melkor, whether it's a slow drip or uh, over many, many thousands of years, or a blast of it over a few short years, will make them appear elderly, and, and eventually their bodies will, will die. Like I described, through the elvish spirit will persist, it will overcome the body, and it will become houseless. Gwyndor may have had his body fully fade if he did not escape, and as a bittersweet mercy, he wound up being slain by Melkor's forces afterwards, and he would wind up in the west, of course, because of that, uh, where it is possible that even his scars may heal. Círdan, too, would eventually sail to the west uh, at some point in the Fourth Age. So how long does it take? Normally, I would say it takes a very long time. Círdan was over 10,000 years old, uh, nearing 12,000 years of age even in the Lord of the Rings. But it depends on, I guess, how much of Melkor's power that the elf is exposed to and for how long they're exposed to it. So I don't think that there's a definitive answer, but that's the best I can do for you. Okay, next question. How did the strength of Ungoliant and Shelob compare to other beings in Tolkien's universe, such as the Maya or Lesser Ainur, like Aula or Manwe? This is the one from the thumbnail, of course. So Ungoliant at her peak was almost unfathomably powerful. Shelob a lot less so. Ungoliant did not start off as extremely powerful. She was a primordial spirit, that was in the service of Melkor, but she was willful, and she left Melkor to be, as Tolkien said, the mistress of her own lust. She was said to be afraid of the Valar, who tried to hunt her down, and when Melkor came to her for an alliance later on, she was afraid of him as well, uh, thinking that he had come to destroy her. And uh, she only came out to speak with him because he threatened her. He threatened to bring down the canyon on her home and bury her. And the reason I'm bringing this all up is to sort of say that she's less powerful than the Valar. So at this point, Melkor, who is the second most powerful being in the universe, was far more fearsome than Ungoliant. However, shortly after, after they destroyed the two trees of Valinor, and they stole the Silmarils, and they fled from the Undying Lands, and they went to Middle-earth, the situation had changed. Melkor was worn out. He was tired. He was feeling weak. While Ungoliant had grown several times in size, and the way it was described in the Silmarillion, she had grown fat with power. And when she attacked Melkor, he was now the one who was in danger. Now, I know what you may say. She was fought off by the Balrogs, run off by a group of Maiar. How great could she really be? But being able to put Melkor in danger, even in his weakened state, shows that she was ridiculously powerful. She was at this point essentially a walking black hole. I tend to think that Ungoliant fleeing from the Balrogs was partly just not wanting prey that puts up a fight. And also, I, I, I tend to think that it had a lot to do with the specific weapons that the Balrogs used. The flaming whips that they had may have been some sort of failsafe that Melkor came up with. Because Ungoliant had you know, served him in the past and that she had betrayed him in the past, he may have given the Balrogs specific anti-Ungoliant weapons. The one thing 
that people tend to not realize about Ungoliant. And I'm going to give you something pretty enlightening here. And I'm, I'm more than happy to share this. Think for a moment about these Malrogs. They're far away in Angband. Very far from where Melkor and Ungoliant were in Lameth. They had to travel across Hithlum to get there after hearing Melkor's scream. And this scream had to be one of the loudest events in the history of the planet to be heard that far away. Something like the meteor impact that destroyed the dinosaurs. You know, that was the loudest event ever to happen in Earth's history. So a scream that could be heard in Angband and deep underground in Angband, not at the surface, from Lammoth, it's not just a sound at this point, it's a shockwave. And Tolkien was hardly ignorant of this fact. He described the shockwave as crumbling mountains. Guess who was at the epicenter of this blast? Ungoliant tanked a shockwave that destroyed mountains miles away and created an echo that would persist until the end of the First Age. She was at least in that very moment at her peak ridiculously powerful. Shelob, however, she was nowhere on that level. She was more than just a big spider. Uh, she was still a horrible abomination in only a vague spidery form, but she did not drink light and spew on light. As I said earlier, she wasn't a threat to any of the Ainur. Uh, Sauron even thought of her as his pet cat. She was very difficult to harm, uh, but she fled from the light of Yarendil that, that her mother was a, a young Goliath, was all but willing to just gobble up, and Sam was able to stab her in the eyes, and though her hide was too thick to be pierced with a sword with normal human strength, her own body weight was able to get Sting to impale her. So, uh, there you have it. Okay, next question. Eru Iluvatar appeared in the main uh, Lord of the Rings story, uh, and why? Um, so, no, I actually don't think that Iluvatar should have appeared directly. I think that Tolkien was right not to have uh, essentially God in the story of The Lord of the Rings. It's not a cosmic story. It's a, it's a war story. It's an adventure story. It's about how the smallest of heroes can change the course of the world. And not through might, but through patience, pity, and mercy. Uh, consider the triumvirate of heroes at the climax of the Lord of the Rings, at the Black Gate, facing down the impossible odds of battling Sauron's army. You have Gandalf, Aragorn, and Imrahil. You have an angel, a mighty king, and a noble prince. And the latter two both have some elvish ancestry in their past. So then we look at the true heroes, Frodo and Sam, and, and the wild card, Gollum, who he's no hero, but he was necessary. So you have a rich lad, his gardener, and this wretched creature that had been shown mercy. That is what winds up defeating Sauron. If there's any hint of the divine in the conclusion of The Lord of the Rings, it is the frame of Sauron, the greatest storm cloud figure crowned with lightning that reaches out to attack Gandalf and Aragorn and Imrahil, and then he's blown away by the wind. He has become impotent due to the actions of Frodo and Sam and Gollum. But whence did this erstwhile breeze appear from? The timing, along with the arrival of the great eagles and Gwehir's specific words to Gandalf, I would bear you whither you will, whether you are made of stone, which is a big change in attitude from basically earlier in the storytelling Gandalf, you're too heavy and carrying you is not my job. Um, there is only one explanation for the eagles being there at that time and for their reverence of Gandalf, uh, as well as this sudden wind. And it's not a Luvatar, it would be Manwe, the king of the breath of Arda, blew Sauron away and sent the eagles. Even then, he is unseen. And you are not told directly that Manwe is responsible. You have to read between the lines. 
Manwe was only mentioned once in the Lord of the Rings and not by name. He was just called the Elder King. And in the index, it's explained that that's Manwe. The Lord of the Rings is not a story of gods and angels. It's, it's the story of Frodo and Aragorn. Okay, next question. Uh Oliphants natural beasts, or were they corruptions of nature, like, like uh, orcs and dragons? Uh, good question. Uh, they are very likely natural beasts. The Mumakil, which were called Oliphants by the Hobbit characters, are likely just really big elephants. Now, we do know that there are elephants in the world of Arda. Because um, in The Hobbit, Gandalf used the expression great elephants to express his surprise at Bilbo not dusting his mantle. Mumakil are likely just a very large breed of elephant. They are not mentioned to be creations or, or corruptions by Sauron or by Morgoth. The reasoning for this is that the various cultures have different names for them. Gandalf, of course, said elephant. Uh, Sam says oliphant. Uh, in Harad, they're called Mumakil, which we don't know the meaning of that. It's not glossed, but most telling of all, the elves had names for these creatures in both of elvish languages, and they're not derisive names that the elves might give to Harad creations, but they're typical descriptive names that they would give to animals. The Sindarin name is Anabon, and the Quenya name is Andamunda, and they both mean the same thing. They mean a uh, long snout. So if the Mumakil were corruptions, I think that they would be, this would be reflected in the elvish name for them, uh, such as the various derivations of the Quenya word, Orko, all translating to goblin. Olog is troll. Calling the animals long snout seems more like the elves simply saw these creatures and described what they saw. Uh, and Quenya is a rather old language that fell out of favor in Middle-earth many years ago in favor of Sindarin. So uh, the Mumakil must be quite old themselves, even if they were only used for war in the Third Age. Okay, next question. Did Gollum survive the War of the Ring? Could he have been sent to Valinor to heal his mind and body? I honestly don't think so. I gotta say that's a no. Um, have you ever wondered why, um, when Gollum was captured by Aragorn, and was interrogated by Gandalf, and it was decided that he would be handed over to elves, why did they choose Thranduil's people instead of, say, Elrond or Galadriel? Um, of course, we already know that Thranduil was set up for prisoners because we know that he had a dungeon from reading The Hobbit, and he had a reputation of treating his prisoners very well. Um, and, of course, this is also a way to introduce Legolas to the story. But why not Elrond or Celeborn, Galadriel? The answer comes to us in the Two Towers and the way that Gollum behaves. He had previously followed the Fellowship out of Moria. He refused, though, to enter Lothlorien. He hated the trees there. He said they stunk, and he could not get the stink out of his hands. He reacted badly to Lembus bread, saying that it tasted like ashes and dust in his mouth and he could not bear the touch of an elvish-made rope. It said it, he, it burned his skin, it froze his skin. The high elves were just too much good for Gollum to handle. It was like anathema to him. The Sylvan elves, the Sindar elves of Mirkwood Forest were described in The Hobbit as being less wise and more dangerous. They were a bit more heathen. They were... Uh, down to earth compared to the high elves and being around them would not harm Gollum in any way if Gollum could not handle Lothlorien he would be in intense pain anywhere near the undying lands uh, uh, much less Valinor uh, it would kill him not heal him what happened to Gollum was probably the most kind thing that could have happened to him because it, he died very quickly probably didn't suffer very much as sad as that sounds it was sort of the best ending for him okay was Sheila but originally a minion of Morgoth before coming becoming evil is there a connection between her and Ungoliant's descent into darkness as they share similar traits uh, so Sheila is actually Ungoliant's uh, daughter as we went over earlier um uh, it was described in The Lord of the Rings that she is the last surviving child of Ungoliant, though Shelob's own children 
infested the world, uh, and most particularly Mirkwood Forest. Sheila was uh, very little actual connection to Sauron, though, uh, and no connection at all to, to Morgoth, really. She came to dwell at the border to Mordor uh, long before Sauron ever came to Mordor. Uh, Sauron thinks of Sheila, as I said earlier, as like his pet cat. She's independent, she doesn't need him, but it suits him to have her there. Sheila goes where the food is, so he makes sure that she's very well fed by driving prisoners that he doesn't need anymore into her lair. Uh, and that makes sure she stays put. So having her there makes it difficult for enemies to get into Mordor. And more importantly, I think, it makes it difficult for his enemies to get out of Mordor. Um, that's probably more pressing to him, actually. Okay, next question. This one... Kenneth Liu, I hope I'm saying the last name right. Oh, what do you think is the message that J.R.R. Tolkien was trying to communicate through The Hobbit? So there's no hidden message here. Uh, there's no allegory. The message of The Hobbit was actually very explicitly stated at the end of the story by Thorin himself. So after the Battle of Five Armies, which Bilbo spent most of unconscious, he got clocked on the head with a rock pretty early on in that, in that event. He wakes up. He removes the ring, and he's found, and he's brought to Thorin. And Thorin has been fatally wounded and is, and is near death. And we are told that Philly and Killy also did not survive the battle. So Bilbo and Thorin speak, and they make their peace, and Thorin apologizes for the way that he had behaved earlier, and Bilbo expresses that he felt that he was undeserving of being in Thorin's company. And Thorin tells Bilbo and the reader the explicit message of the story. I'm going to read you this small little bit from The Hobbit. No, said Thorin. There is more in you of good than you know, child of the kindly West. Some courage and some wisdom blended in measure. If more of us valued food and cheer and song above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world. But sad or merry, I must leave it now. Farewell. So, you know, with his last words Thorin tells us the the message that the hobbit is about greed being evil the villain of the story is greed a dragon sitting on a hoard of gold it's unable to spend it or use it for anything and unwilling to spend it or use it for anything it just keeps it just to keep it even after the dragon is slain Greed manifests in Thorin, who gets what Tolkien refers to as dragon sickness, and he refuses to share the treasure with those that are in need, even the ones that killed the dragon. Thorin came to his senses, and he states that the world is better off with people like Bilbo, who value things that matter and not hoarded gold. And Bilbo exemplifies this in, in the sequel, in The Lord of the Rings. He is rich. He's very rich, but he freely spends his money. He gives it away. He enjoys it. He enjoys the company of others. He doesn't keep his money in a big pile and sleep on it, never to use it. He doesn't refuse those who are in need. Uh, he gives away almost the last drop of his money at the end of the story to Sam. So there you have it. Okay, next question. This one came in from, uh, oh, once again, I, I really do hope I'm saying the name correctly, Agatha Passicenza, I think? In the tale of Aragorn and Arwen, it says, In the Garden of Elrond, where none now walk, this is in 120 of the Fourth Age, does the fact that nobody walks in the Garden of Elrond anymore mean that Celeborn, Eladan, and Elrohir have already left Rivendell? Um... So here's the thing, nobody has ever really pinned down exactly when the last ship sailed to the west. Some speculation has put the sailing of the last ship, which would contain Círdan and Celeborn, as late as 171 of the Fourth Age, or even later than this. This is based on differing versions of the Red Book, with the Thane's copy making reference to some people stating that Círdan may still dwell in Mithlond and thus he has not passed into the West. And this copy of the book was created and published in 171 of the Fourth Age. However, Aragorn's words suggest that Rivendell was empty in 120 of the Fourth Age. Now, we know that Celeborn 
had tired of lived in, living in uh, East Lorien, and he came to live in Rivendell with his grandsons, and that he eventually did pass to the West, though his grandson's fate is unknown. So there are sort of three possibilities here. The first possibility is that Aragorn's words should be taken at face value and that Rivendell was in fact empty at this point. This would suggest that Celeborn has already sailed to the west. The second possibility, Aragorn's words are correct, but Celeborn and his grandsons dwell elsewhere in Middle-earth, perhaps in Lindon, and have not yet sailed to the west. Third, Aragorn is just wrong, and he is only assuming at this point that Rivendell is empty. And this is very po uh, possible due to the fact that he's dying at this moment. He's on his deathbed, so he may not be thinking all that clearly. So out of these three possibilities, I prefer number two. I think that's the one that's true. Uh, Aragorn is correct. Rivendell is empty, but that while Celeborn has relocated possibly to Círdan's land, he has not necessarily yet taken a ship into the west. This is backed up by the fact that the same year that Aragorn died, in 120 of the Fourth Age, both Legolas and Gimli sailed to the west, as I mentioned earlier. And as the ship that Celeborn was on was the last ship to sail to the west, while Rivendell may be empty, Celeborn was still somewhere in Middle-earth. If indeed El Eladan and Elro here were now mortal, it is possible that Celeborn was waiting for them to, to die before passing to the west. And that as Rivendell had become mostly empty, uh, they wished to be in Lindon until the end. So that's my thoughts on it. Okay, next question. This one came... Vargas, who asks, why did Aragorn and the army, especially the Rohirrim, ditch their horses at the Battle of the Black Gate? Ah, oh, they didn't. There's no indication that they did this, even in, uh, in the book, though. Uh, in the movie, that's a little different. Let's be real. The only reason that the films had the heroes get off of their horses was for the dramatic charging scene where Aragorn looks at the camera and says, for Frodo, and he charges forward joined by his friends and then by everybody else. If you can get a shot like that, you get it. Even if it doesn't make sense from a, a military tactics standpoint, the scene and the shot are etched into our memories for a good reason. It was awesome. In the book though, they of course did not ditch their horses. They rode the horses there. They were on their horses during the battle. Even the mouth of Sauron was, was riding a horse or at least something like a horse because it was described as monstrous. Okay. From The Enlightened, who asks, uh, in the future of Middle-earth, would Frodo be remembered considering the heroes and tales that came before are mostly concerned with fighters and mages? Of course, he would be remembered, and not just in the Shire. Frodo, of course, wrote everything down in the Red Book, which had already contained Bilbo's previous story, There and Back Again, which is The Hobbit. And Frodo and Sam, with help from their friends and the Counts of the Wise, wrote The Downfall of the Lord of the Rings and The Return of the King. And Bilbo also gave uh, another book, Translations from Elvish Lore, which is The Silmarillion, to Sam before he sailed to the West. The Red Book would make sure that their stories were known to the people at large, and Aragorn uh, even made Frodo's birthday a holiday in the reunited kingdom, as well as uh, there was also a ring day that served as their leap year in his new calendar. Question. This one came in from... Oh, these names. I'm very sorry if I say it wrong. Katarzyna Mat Matila? I, see, I think. I'm sorry if I butcher it. How canon is Feanor being emotionally abusive as a husband, as a father, and as a brother? I feel like Silmarillion clearly portrays him as such, but I may be biased. So I don't think he was emotionally abusive as a husband or as a father. As a brother, yeah, he was a real piece of work. Or at least he was a piece of something. Feanor's wife... Uh, she wanted nothing to do with his oath, and she did not follow him to Middle-earth. And we really get no indication that he tried to force her or compel her to go with him, or that he treated her badly at any point. He basically just left and did his own thing. 
His sons all adored him enough to follow him into perdition, at least. Their love of their father echoed his own love of his father, Finwa, which was unconditional. However, he was a real jerk to his half-brother, Fingolfin. He hated the fact that his father remarried, and he seemed unable to actually take the old man to task for that. Instead, of he took it out on Fingolfin. Uh, as Finwa's previous marriage to Feanor's mother, Muriel, was essentially annulled, this made Feanor retroactively the illegitimate child. Um, while there was supposed to be no death in the Undying Lands, and thus no succession of kings, what Feanor feared was not Fingolfin usurping him as the Prince of the Noldor, but in his father's heart. Fingolfin, for his part, did his best to treat Feanor correctly. He even stated that though they were half-brothers by blood, he, they, they were full brothers in his heart. The words of Melkor, though, they really did a, a, a number on Feanor's brain. He couldn't get it out of his head that Fingolfin was going to take his place. So towards the end of his life, uh, Tolkien was working on a version of the story in which Feanor was far more evil, uh, even outright murdering one of his sons simply for suspecting that he was going to sail back to Amon and forsake the oath. But of course, that never got included in the Silmarillion as it was, so there you have it. Anyway, that was the last question, and if you got all the way through this video, you must have enjoyed it. So if you haven't yet, hit the like button, subscribe, and if you really want to support the channel and help me continue to do this for you guys on, on, a, on a growing scale, consider membership. Um, I don't know if membership is yet open when this video is going to go live, but it is going to be opening very soon. You will get to see the videos early, and there are going to be other perks that I'm going to detail in a, in a separate video about membership opening. But anyway, we'll see you guys next time. Send me some questions.